Um, hello, everyone. Um, good morning and welcome to the March California Nevada Drought Early Warning System Drought and Climate Outlook webinar. Thank you to those that have joined us previously and those that may be joining us for the first time. Uh, my name is Amanda Sheffield and I am the Regional Drought Information Coordinator for NIDIS in California, Nevada. Uh, this is part of a bi-monthly webinar series that we've designed to provide the region with timely information on current drought status and associated impacts as well as a preview of developing climatic events. Uh, this webinar is co-hosted the California Nevada Applications Program, who is a NOAA RESA team, and this webinar is special co-host with the USDA California Climate Hub, who you'll hear from later a bit. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available later this week on drought.gov and our YouTube channel, both of, what I, both of which I have put into the chat box. Uh, just a little background on what is NIDIS, um, for those who don't know or don't remember, we are the National Integrated Drought Information System. Um, our mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risk by providing those with the best available information and resources that we can. Um, we realized this mission through a bunch of different activities, including regional drought early warning systems, of which California and Nevada is one of them, prediction and forecast activities, integrating research and monitoring, helping with drought planning and preparedness, collaborating with our existing programs of partners across federal, state, local, tribal, and beyond uh, partners. And also we host the US Drought Portal or drought.gov. As I mentioned, we use, do regional drought early warning systems to do these types of activities, including California, Nevada, which we've utilized those new and existing partner networks to make information easily available and understandable for, and usable for decision-making, um, such as webinars like this. Um, some of you who are on our last webinar got to have a nice little showcase of the last drought duck of, of the new drought.gov. We just launched this uh, website, the redesigned website in January of 2021. Um, has a lot more detailed information down to your local county level, interactive maps, historical drought information, new information by sector, research and learn, and more. And so if you go to, you can visit the website or if you go to our YouTube channel, I'll share the link in the chat in a second. You can watch a three minute video on it or also go into the deep dive that we, we shared back in January. And before we move on to our great speakers, which we've got a great lineup today, I just wanted to mention a little bit about how you can report on what drought and drought impacts you are seeing. Um, there is a tool called See More Drought, Condition Monitoring Observation Reports. And these aren't just, these are opportunities for people to get on their ground experience, um, report it up to the people that are making the drought monitor and at the state level decision making and things like that. And so I just wanted to mention that this tool lets you tell things like how many times if you've seen drought like you're currently seeing, what, how, when was the last time it's been dry in this part of your country? Um, more than just crops, what other way are drought impacting you? Are people relocating? Is there less food? Is there air quality or dust or pollen issues and more? As well, since we're gonna have some rangeland speakers today, I wanna to mention that if you're in the rangeland community, there are a lot of features there for the rangeland and livestock information that you can report your impacts as well. And with that, um, today we've got a great webinar for you guys today. Um, our first two speakers are Dan McAvoy from the Western Regional Climate Center and Nathan Patrick from the California Nevada River Forecast Center. And then after that, we're gonna dig into some rangeland conditions uh, with the Climate Hub and from extension in both the University of Nevada, Reno and the U University of California. Um, with that, Dan, I will pass control over to you. Okay, well, um, great. Thank you, Amanda. Um, let me get into full screen mode here. Am I, okay. Okay, well, yeah, thank you for having me today. I'm um, going to give you an overview of um, where we're at with our current drought conditions. This is a photo I took in February from uh, near the Mount Rose Wilderness. And while it's a nice picture and there is snow on the ground and there was been, uh, at least in the northern Sierra, enough snow for decent skiing, I'll show you that the amount of snow on the ground is actually far less than it should be for this time of year. Um, so for, I want to start off with the current drought conditions from the U.S. Drought Monitor to get a kind of a snapshot of where, of where our region's at. And on the left is the latest drought monitor map released last Thursday. Um, and nearly the entire California Nevada region is in some shaded color there with D0 uh, being abnormally dry, being the lightest yellow. Um, 
And the most widespread D3 and D4 extreme and exceptional drought is over uh, central and southern Nevada with uh, some D3 and, two and D4 into parts of California as well. Now on the right, we have how this map has changed over the past three months. And what we see is there hasn't been a whole lot of improvements. Uh, there has been some degradations and the drought um, really has intensified throughout this winter with the exception of uh, Northwest California where they've had quite a bit of degradation and complete drought removal. So they've improved a bit in the corner over there. I also just wanna mention that the upper or the Colorado River Basin um, is still uh, have a lot of drought in that region, which is going to affect the the water supply coming in the southern Nevada and, and a bit into southern California too. So let's get into the um, the precipitation we had this winter. So our core winter months, December, December January, February uh, this year turned out to be um, mostly a bust for a lot of places. So December was dry for nearly the entire region. This is the percent of normal precipitation for each month, um, and then January we had one major atmospheric river storm this year, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a few slides. So a few areas uh, in January saw above normal precipitation, but there were also a lot of areas below normal. And then February uh, was very dry again, especially the southern part of the region, the Sierra Nevada. Um, Northern Nevada did okay in, in February. They had a decent storm cycle that brought some snow to the Ruby Mountains and, and the Humboldt Basin up there. And so as now we're uh, through most of March and, and we look often for the miracle March to, to help us, which we can get sometimes when we have a dry winter, we can still get decent precipitation and snowpack um, in March, but that really hasn't happened this year. So this is the March 1st through 18th percent of normal precipitation. Um, and all the browns are, are below normal. And so nearly again, the entire region is, is below normal. Um, there are a few pockets of above normal, but in general, March um, has, this has not been a drought busting March by any means. Um, although Colorado, um, the Colorado River Basin did have some uh, decent storminess this month, but they are also still um, in drought conditions there. And so one point I really wanna stress um, as a key point today is, is for the region, we're now into the second year of a multi-year drought. And so this is a time series of the Sierra Nevada climate region, um, October through February. So the beginning of the water year through February, uh, precipitation totals going all the way back to 1895 and each bar there is uh, the October through February precipitation. And so you can see on the bottom right there, that's the past two years, October through February. This year has been the 11th driest on record and the year before, uh, last year was the eighth driest on record. And so this is the only uh, only the second time um, in this whole record where we've had two years in a row um, below 15 inches for this Sierra Nevada region. The other time was 1976 and 1977. And the median is, is just under 30 inches. So this year and last year about 50% uh, of normal or a little less for October through February. And it's really getting into the second year of a drought and longer in you know two, three, four year droughts where we really start to see the impact showing up. And so uh, not a big surprise here, but the, the primary reason that we've been so dry is due to a lack of large storms that often come from atmospheric rivers. And so this is a great graphic produced by CW3E. Um, the map on the right is showing um, the kind of the landfall of atmospheric rivers this year. And this was updated on February 11th, so it's not quite up to date. Um, but I can say pretty confidently that this map hasn't changed that much even through present since there haven't been any major atmospheric rivers um, since February 11th. But you see nearly all the arrows going up into Oregon, Oregon coast and Washington coast with only uh, two arrows directly impacting uh, the California coast and a big one on January 28th that uh, brought a, a big portion of the uh, precipitation and snowpack uh, to the region. And so we really need these big storms um, and we've been lacking them so far this year. Um, so aside from precipitation, uh, we have other things um, like the evaporative demand. And so this is the evaporative demand drought index um, which, which is based on uh, temperature, wind, solar radiation, and humidity. And so it reflects the atmospheric moisture. 
Um, and on the left, we have the three month eddy ending March 17th. And on the right, we have the six month. Um, so these are the previous three months and the previous six months. Um, and so we do see some persistent high evaporative demand values, particularly in central and coastal California and down in, into southern Nevada. And so uh, this will act to amplify the precipitation deficits, um, increased um, evapotranspiration when there's water at the surface, um, increased drying of the vegetation, and that sort of thing will uh, come from this high evaporative demand. Um, so no surprise after showing the precipitation maps, but the snowpack uh, is below normal throughout nearly the entire region. So on the left, we have the basin numbers from um, three major California basins. Um, the north and central are both uh, just under 70% of normal, and the southern Sierra is far worse uh, at 44% uh, of normal. And then on the right, we have the basins um, that drain uh, into Nevada, and they're doing a little bit better. Um, the Eastern Sierra is uh, still quite dry, but conditions are a bit better in Northeast, in Northeast Nevada. And so, um, so those were the percent of average snowpacks I was showing there. Now I'm showing the, the automated snow pillow sensors. Each circle or X is a, is a station. And so this is one way to classify snow drought. Um, and, and in this particular instance, I'm using less than 30th percentile. And so all the colored dots there are stations that are less than the 30th percentile. And then the X's are stations that are above that threshold. And so we see the Sierra Nevada stands out uh, really clearly. And it gets quite, uh, quite a bit more intense as you go further into the Southern Sierra. And so uh, again, Northeast Nevada is doing a bit uh, better from a snowpack perspective. Um, and I did want to mention again just how uh, impactful that one atmospheric river we had, uh, the strong one at the end of January. This is a time series of snow water equivalent from Mammoth Pass um, in the eastern Sierra. And so throughout this whole year they've made it up to almost 20 inches of snow water equivalent and nearly half of that just came from a three-day storm cycle um, in late January. And so it would have been pretty devastating uh, without that. And they're still pretty far below normal, but that one storm saved kind of uh, a total disaster of a year. Um, and so it just shows you how important those large storms are for the region. And so I want to spend a little time on this soil moisture slide. And so this is the uh, soil moisture, uh, the percent saturation um, for the Eastern Sierra region. And I believe this is the, the Truckee, the Walker, and the Carson River basins. Um, and it shows the trace of the percent saturation. Um, and then it, the, the years here are 2004 through, through 2021. So not a very long period of record, um, but this is very uh, concerning to see this, that this year is the lowest on record and also lower than any uh, of the years in the 2012 to 2015 drought. And so we had an extremely dry start to the water year and fall, and the fall was extremely dry. We, we know how bad the fire season was. And so we never got the soils uh, to get that uh, water content going up in the fall. And you can see how low it was and it just never recovered since then. And so uh, this is gonna lead to some more impacts going into the spring and summer, uh, like decreased runoff and then um, in the, the vegetation and the fire danger is going to dry out faster and the fire danger is going to ramp up um, quite a bit earlier due to this. Um, again, not a surprise here based on what I've already shown, but the stream flow throughout the region um, is quite low. There's a lot of uh, gauges. This is the 28-day percent, 28-day uh, average stream flow for the region. Um, and there's a lot of areas, uh, in, you know, below that 10th, uh, percentile and so a lot of uh, stream flow drought conditions right now. And again, I want to get back to this point of the multi-year drought and the reservoir storage is now starting to decrease pretty substantially. Um, on the left, we have the California major reservoirs and uh, the, north, the large northern California reservoirs are substantially below average. Uh, they're all below 70% of average or lower. Um, and then on the right, we have the Nevada reservoirs from March 1st and their percent of capacity and how they compare to uh, the year before. And they're all, um, with the exception of Southern Nevada, quite a bit lower uh, than last year. 
And so again, I just want to emphasize this point, the multi-year droughts are when we start to see uh, the water supply issues. And so on the left, we have um, several of the large California reservoirs and their storage on March 18th from each year from 2012 through 2021. And I just want to point out that uh, three of the reservoirs, Oroville, Bullard's Bar, and Folsom, are lower now than they were um, on March 18th during any of those uh, major drought years. And so the reservoirs are falling off quickly and there's gonna be some water supply issues this summer for sure. Um, and so, yeah, just to wrap up, wrap up here, um, we have seen intensification of drought over nearly the entire region with a few minor exceptions. Um, very low precipitation and snowpack throughout the region. Uh, we're into this multi-year drought, and now we're going to start, um, if we haven't already, started feeling the impacts this spring and summer. And some of those impacts, which may have started already in some places, include might include um, poor range and grazing conditions, uh, reduced water supply, and then the fire danger increasing um, as we go into the spring. And so I will stop there and stop sharing. So thank you. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, we're we're going to do our next presenter and then do a few questions there before we move on to the rest of the webinar for the folks that are online. Um, and you can enter your questions into the questions box. With that, I'll start Nathan's presentation. Sure I can find. Sorry, I just got to take control back. There we go. Uh, Nathan, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, um, go ahead and advance to the next slide. All right, so I'm gonna start with my key takeaways uh, rather than doing a summary at the end. Um, to begin with, uh, La Nina conditions are expected to weaken into uh, usual conditions by summer. Um, the Climate Prediction Center seasonal outlook suggests warmer than normal temperatures and drier than normal conditions for April, May, and June. Unfortunately, following a below average year in 2020, our water year 2021 and seasonal water supply forecasts are expecting below normal runoff. Um, it's very unlikely spring precipitation will help forecast recover. Uh, unlike last year when we were coming off a wet year, uh, reservoirs are holding a reduced volume of water compared to normal, um, as was previously shown. Uh, this reduced reservoir volume may play a larger factor this year when uh, regulating the supply. Um, and lastly, drought conditions are expected to persist over the entire region through at least June. And recovery this summer could depend on how productive the North American monsoon ends up being. If you recall, last year's North American monsoon was disappointing and produce very little precipitation for Nevada, Arizona, and portions of California. So you can go ahead and advance it to the next slide. Okay, so the current diagnostic discussion produced by the International Research Center and Climate Prediction Center indicates a 60% chance that current La Nina conditions will transition to ENSO neutral conditions during the spring. Um, overall, they indicated the coupled ocean atmosphere system remains consistent with a weak or decaying La Nina. And looking at the plot, the models indicate sea surface temperature anomalies will be reduced to less than about a half a degree, negative half degree Celsius, uh, which is one of the thresholds used for identifying La Nina. Um, unlike the rest of the United States, we've actually have experienced a pretty typical La Nina um, across California. We've been a little bit cooler than normal. But as we expected, um, precipitation has been below normal, at least for the southern portions of uh, California and Nevada, and uh, the northern portions of, of California have fared slight, slightly better. Okay, go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, one of the interesting things on the NOAA ENSO blog that you can check out for this uh, March is this plot. Uh, the spaghetti plot traces depict all of the past first year La Nina's and then the ENSO outcomes for the following year. Um, as you can see, most of the prior La Niñas indicated a weakening towards neutral conditions during the summer months, uh, and then followed by more variability. 
By the following winter, some years were neutral, some years returned to La Nina, and very few experienced El Nino conditions. Um, and officially, in, in this sort of scenario, only two El Ninos have ever followed a La Nina since 1950. Okay, you can advance the next slide. Uh, with the previous slide in mind, here are the official uh, probabilistic ENSO forecasts as of March 11th. Uh, the probabilities are derived using the model output, but it also includes human forecaster's input to come up with the consensus forecast. Uh, La Nina probabilities are indicated by the blue bars, uh, neutral probabilities are indicated by the gray bars, and then the El Ninos are indicated by the red bars. As noted earlier, neutral conditions are the favored probability starting with the April, May, and June time period. Okay, go ahead and advance the next slide. Uh, with the March 19th update, uh, model only results produce slightly higher neutral probabilities compared to the official March ENSO forecast. Uh, one thing to note compared to the official forecast is the dampening of La Nina probabilities in the upcoming fall winter season and the resultant increase in the probabilities of El Nino. Uh, if we look forward, this would be something to monitor for in future official uh, consensus forecasts. Additionally, in certain time periods of the year, uh, ENSO forecasts prove to be less reliable, and this is usually the case uh, during the Northern Hemisphere spring. All right. Uh, CPC's seasonal temperature outlook for April to June is indicating a 33 to 60% chance of warmer than normal temperatures. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you to advance the slide. The California and Nevada regions. You can go ahead and advance the slide again. Um, likewise, uh, for precipitation, CPC's uh, outlook for April to June indicates normal precipitation for Southern California and far Southern Nevada. Elsewhere, uh, there's about a 33% to 60% uh, chance of below normal precipitation uh, is being forecasted by CPC. Uh, something to keep in mind, normal precipitation is a relative quantity. Many of these locations uh, typically don't get very much precipitation during this time period. Uh, and for example, the last two years, uh, Southern California did get some precip around Memorial Day, uh, but that's not a normal occurrence. Okay, go ahead and advance the slide. Okay, turning our attention to the runoff and the stream flow forecast, looking at the NRCS snow water equivalent percentiles for the period of record ending on March 19th, uh, these are primarily snow tell sites with some co op locations mixed in. Um, in order to show up on this uh, plot, you need to have at least 20 years of data, um, and that's indicated by the coloring. Orange and red colors indicate the uh, snow water equivalent below the 50th percentile, while greens and blues indicate uh, the SWE above the 50th percentile. In general, across the region, SWE is between the 25th and 75th percentile, uh, with most locations below the 50th percentile. Um, as we think about stream flow and runoff in the spring, this will be an indicator that the reduced snowpack compared to normal uh, will impact these runoff amounts. Uh, go ahead and advance the slide. Here's another view of the water precipitation in the Sierra provided by California's Division of Water Resources. Uh, the current year's cumulative daily precipitation traces are indicated in dark blue. Uh, the cyan color areas indicate the progression of the cumulative to date average precipitation using a 1966 to 2015 base period. Uh, traces outside the cyan areas have indicate the wet years, while traces inside the cyan areas indicate the drier years. Uh, to date, the Northern Sierra eight station index is 55% of average as of this past weekend. Uh, we did pick up some precipitation uh, on Friday into Saturday, so these numbers might be slightly different than what was shown before. Uh, the Tulare Six Station Index for the Southern Sierra is 41% of average. And for the Central Sierra, the San Joaquin Five Station Index is 53%. A couple of things to note, all of the traces clearly show the dry start to the water year that began this past fall. As we entered the primary precipitation months of December, January, and February, uh, water year deficits were already in place. 
um, outside of the one atmospheric river that was talked about earlier in January. Uh, most of the storms have produced modest storm totals, and you can sort of see how perhaps in the past years, particularly the wet years, uh, you can see the evidence of the atmospheric uh, river events um, as we move through the um, different water years. Uh, this year's trace seems to be following last year's trace, but we were fortunate last year to have some springtime storms. Um, whereas current outlooks uh, and climatology suggest this is not likely, but we can remain hopeful, uh, hopefully, that we'll get some rain this spring. Um, typically, on average, about 80 to 90 percent of water years precipitation occurs prior to April 1st. Okay, you can go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, here's a view of the river forecast centers model depicting simulated snow water equivalent. Uh, for certain basins, we have the ability to model snowpack in multiple elevation zones, which we typically divide into lower, middle, and upper zones. Um, on this slide, middle and upper zones, uh, snow water uh, equivalent percent of normal is depicted. In general, we are mo currently modeling a below normal snowpack, which then will impact our runoff forecast that um, I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, so you can see in northern northeast Nevada, this is uh, you know over the uh, Ruby Range. Uh, you can actually see that we are um, currently anticipating almost near normal, um, where some of the other metrics have shown uh, below normal conditions. So northeast Nevada might have a, a decent snowpack uh, this year compared to to normal, and that might be what we're modeling. But in general, we are experiencing um, below normal conditions. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. All right, so this slide shows the River Forecast Center's water year 2021 water supply forecast. Um, percent of normal is indicated by the color scale. Uh, as we can see, the dominance of the red and brown color indicates that for water year 2021, we are forecasting runoffs to typically be 50% or less of normal. Although not depicted here, uh, the seasonal April to July runoff percent of normal is slightly higher. And that's because um, we had such a dry start to the, to the water year back in the fall that we have received some precipitation this uh, winter. And so the seasonal runoff from April to July uh, will be slightly higher than what's shown by this uh, water year um, supply forecast. And I'll just uh, mention that if you are interested in learning more about a particular uh, location, locations forecast trend, you can access this information through the web link provided or on our CNRC website. So you can go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. So we already saw the, the image on the left, uh, but I will talk a little bit about it. Um, we, on the left, we have reservoir conditions as of March 18th across California. Uh, the yellow portion of the bar plots indicate the total capacity of the reservoirs. And I believe they are scaled in size to one another, indicating their total storage. Um, the red line through the bar plots indicate the historical average. Um, the blue portion of the bar plots indicate the current water volume. And below the bar plots are the percent of capacity in blue, while the percent of historical average is in red. Across California, we have a mixed picture of reservoir storage health. Uh, Northern California is below its historical average. Um, while some of the areas in the central and southern uh, California regions are, are mixed. And then talking about our water supply forecast is the image on the right. And um, here we have the Folsom Reservoir just outside Sacramento in the American River Basin. Uh, the median water year 2021 trend supply forecast as of March 19th is just over 1 million acre feet, which represents 38% of the mean runoff. In the plot, the green trace is the median daily forecast as it moves through the water year. Our forecasts incorporate current conditions, near-term weather modeling, and then historical climatology. Um, it does not include hydrologic uncertainty. So what was mentioned earlier is with the really dry soils that we had uh, all fall, um, basically the soils really never had the opportunity to wet up. And so that is gonna impact runoff and so a lot of the spring melt that normally perhaps would come off as runoff is, is actually going to be used just to uh, wet in the soils and the runoff might be reduced. And so that's one of the hydrologic uncertainties uh, that we're not quite sure of exactly how um, 
how efficient the model is going to do with, with generating that runoff. So, but going back to the, the green trace, um, we can see that the drop in the green trace from the beginning of the water year is consistent with the lack of precipitation this past fall and winter. Uh, the spikes in the green traces as we move through the water year is in response to forecasted and observed precipitation. The observed accumulated volume to date is indicated by the dark pink trace. And while this trace will rise with spring runoff, it is not going to be able to recover to reach a mean water year volume as indicated by the shaded pink region. It's simply too late in the accumulation time period to see a significant uptick in the forecasted runoff. The best we can hope for is for spring storms that will flatten the downward trend of the green forecasted trace. Um, for this water year, this is the typical pattern found throughout California and Nevada. And if you're interested in finding more of these, you can find them on our website. So uh, water supply managers will have to incorporate the status of the reservoirs along with the runoff forecast to help fill the reservoirs and allocate water uh, during the dry uh, season. You can go ahead and advance the slide. And so then my final slide just shows the U.S. seasonal drought outlook. Uh, unfortunately, everything that has been presented so far today uh, seems to suggest that the, the drought will persist through much of the West until at least the end of June. And, and we'll just have to be hopeful that we do get some um, monsoon precipitation this summer. Um, otherwise, it will be hard to uh, you know, turn the trend, I guess. And uh, with that, I will uh, conclude. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Um, at this time, I'm going to do a couple questions before we pass it on to Lauren for the Rangeland speakers. Um, the first one that came up, and I think this one might be a little bit more for Dan, I'm not exactly sure, is are there depth average soil saturation for other West Coast areas? I wasn't sure if that was shown by, um, which I think it was probably Dan. Um, are there? Traces for Depth other average water. saturation, yeah. Yeah, so I pulled those from NRCS, um, their webpage, and they do have other areas and other basins uh, throughout the area, but that's uh, pretty much what they have with the Sierra because they mostly have the Eastern Sierra basins. So, yes. And then um, someone was curious about the climate tracker. They went to the website and they noticed the login. Could you just explain how to access those right now? Um, uh, sure. Yeah, the new the state climate trackers. Uh, they will ask you to log in, and, and I believe it's on the upper right hand side of the page. You can create a free uh, a free account and and uh, get logged in. Great. And you can contact me if you have any issues with that, and I can try to help help you out. And then last question, I think it's both you, but mostly probably Nathan. Um, in California, are there hints at trends in snow level elevation changes? It would help them understand regionally why vegetation dry out faster and how we could prioritize fuel reduction. Some of their thoughts. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if we necessarily have a product that we uh, put out that shows that. Um, the, the the nearest thing that I can do is, like I say, is we, we at least in terms of our modeling, we, we tend to divide things up by a lower, a middle, and an upper zone. In some years, we have much more lower zone sort of elevation snow um, compared to others. Last year, we actually had a decent amount of low elevation snow. This year, we, we actually, actually don't really have any left. Um, most of the low snow elevation um, or has has already melted off so um, pretty much everything that's going to be uh, coming off this spring is going to be either from our middle or our upper zones but yeah unfortunately i don't have a uh, product that i can point you to 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 see uh exactly where the snow is coming or the the runoff or the melt is, is coming off of from Uh, that's all the questions I had. Thank you both for answering those questions real quick there. And 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 even though we don't have a tool, Nathan, that's a great answer because I was curious then of how the low elevation snow was doing. So that's probably good to know for them to know for this season, especially for thinking about snow melt and fires and all those things. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, there are there are still, I think in some basins we might have like an inch or two left of sweet in the lower zone, but um for the most part, we've been having to 
add a little bit of low elevation snow over the last week or two. Um, so we're basically running out of low elevation snow. Great, thank you. Um, Lauren, I pass control over you, to you. Um, so the next part of the webinar is gonna talk about rangeland conditions and Lauren Parker is here from the, California, the USDA California Climate Hub to talk a little about, about them and then introduce the two speakers from each state. Hi everyone. Um, Amanda, unfortunately it's, I'm getting a message that I'm gonna to have to quit, go to webinar and reopen in order to share my screen. So maybe okay. if you could pull up my slides yeah. are I really don't even need them. I could just talk for a couple minutes about the California Hub if that's easier. i uh, just go ahead and get started and I'll download them and pop up when I get them. Just go okay. Them. Go. Um, sure. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm Lauren Parker. I'm the coordinator for the California Climate Hub. The Climate Hub program um, was stood up in 2014 under the Obama administration um, as a means to provide regionally specific um, resources, uh, science-based information and tools for um, working lands uh, managers, um, farmers, ranchers, foresters and the like. And the idea was to provide resources to help folks adapt to um, climate change. It's a um, unique uh collaboration across a number of usda agencies so principally we work with agricultural research service the forest service and nrcs but certainly that's not um the the laundry list of folks that we work with within usda and um our implementation is is region specific because there's this recognition that each part of the country has its own set of climate related stressors and needs and in california um, we focus on the state's um, forests within agriculture. We typically focus on specialty crops and then uh, a bit on rangelands as well. And um, if we can go, yeah, exactly. Slide number three, perfect. Um, so one of the ways that we support uh, decision making among our, our stakeholders is we provide um, we do conduct a, a little bit of original research, but we also develop regional vulnerability assessments, needs assessments, um, and adaptation decision support tools to support working lands. Um, we recently um, developed a reforestation toolkit as an example. Um, and since uh, we're gonna be talking about rangelands in this part of the webinar, I wanted to just share that um, we're, we're in the very early stages of working to develop um, with, with Leslie and some other partners, a grasslands productivity forecast tool. This is also called GrassCast. It's um, currently quite popular and used across the, the Northern and Southern Plains, as you can see in that image there. Um, and so we're gonna work on putting something like that to, uh, together for um, California. And just kind of, uh, a, you know, to repeat myself a little bit, I guess, um, and, and drive it home for all of you, the overarching mission of the Climate Hub program is really to serve as a bridging organization. And we try to enable climate resilient agriculture and facilitate communication across our agency partners within USDA and um, stakeholders, whether that's folks that are working for state offices, um, farmers and ranchers individually, forest managers, uh, on private forest lands and the like. And, um, you know, we really uh, work to create capacity among organizations and support the use of tools and products that can help um, folks make climate adaptive decisions. And so I would encourage you all to just reach out to us, um, you know, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or want to get involved. And with that, uh, I want to turn it over. This session, part of our session, is going to be focused on um, rangelands and kind of thinking about drought impacts on rangelands. Uh, we're going to start with Carrie Jean Amarad. She's an assistant professor um, at um, UNR and is the Nevada State Rangeland Specialist. And she leads the Nevada Living with Drought Program. She's going to talk about rangeland conditions in Nevada and drought impacts and what that looks like today. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm Carrie Jean Ormerod. I'm a social scientist in the Department of Geography 
but I also lead Extensions Living with Drought program here in Nevada. And I'm one of those bridge people that you're talking about that I try to um, facilitate as best I can through our programming, a conduit connecting citizens and natural resource managers to the best science-based information on my Living with Drought new website, um, which I ha which is pictured for you here. That's livingwithdrought.com. Um, there's resources. There's three things there: definitions of drought and drought impacts, and really a call to action uh, to uh, condition more condition monitoring, which Amanda talked about at the start of this meeting. And we also have a resource page, and I just wanted to highlight that because there is spe resources specific to agriculture and livestock, and that's up-to-date information to prepare and respond to drought, stuff from NIDAS, stuff from Extension, and the Western um, um, NDMC and uh, WRRC, but we are, I also have information about drought assistance programs to help recover from drought. That's the SBA and FSA programs and um, disaster de designations from USDA, and also the ag risk viewer from USDA about crop insurance. So there is some information at your fingertips for Nevada specific uh, resources um, if you're interested. And I also wanted to um, bring people's attention to a new publication we have available. Um, this is a partnership between the University of Nevada Extension and the Nevada Climate Initiative Climate Working Group. And we've developed this short primer on climate change and um, kind of the current and projected effects in Nevada. And it's a nice distilled resource for anybody that's interested. And I'll put the links to those um, in uh, the chat. And this is ADA accessible too. So you can share it um, electronically in, with your communities of interest. So with, with that, I'd like to just, um, I'm, but joining me on the call today is Gary McEwen, who's a Nevada Extension Educator and Rangeland Specialist. I am not that, I'm a social scientist. So I wanted to take a few minutes to um, help put Nevada into context and explain for those that uh, may not know Nevada's geographical personality, which uh, makes information sharing difficult in our region. Um, so most folks know Nevada's dry, but we have a physical geography that's also complicates things for us. We have the two distinct areas of the Great Basin and the Colorado River. We have the high and low desert. We have lots of north-south trending mountain ranges and scattered throughout the state with their shadow effects. We have 200 plus watersheds. Um, so we have microclimates and microclimates and microclimates and lots of spatial um, and temporal variability in different soil types as well. Um, in addition to this, prevailing aridity and lots of um, heterogeneity, heterogeneity. We have wind, which contributes to evapotranspiration. And um, when we're talking about rangeland, we have to consider both hydrological drought and vegetative drought conditions and how drought can impact um, both plant variety, density and size, but also surface waters and spring. So that's like some of the complications of our physical geography, but layered on top of that, we have some additional um, political and legal geography that's unique to Nevada. Um, so the USDM, the US Drought Monitor, uh, uses data to assess and represent drought, which has specific and significant implications for Nevada because 85% or more than 85% of our land is managed by agencies of the US government, right? So, Federal management and regulatory decisions are made months in advance, and this grazing policy and forecasting is tied to chronological dates that prohibit really the flexible response options that ranchers want to have, given the high levels of variability, flexibility would be best, but they're, they're, that's not always an option for folks in Nevada. And those on the call know well that the U.S. Drought Monitor is designed to represent drought conditions after consulting with hundreds of experts and specialists across the United States, including Cooperative Extension. And we do our best, um, but this also, um, because it is the best representation of drought, it also determines which areas are eligible for drought-related tax deferrals from the IRS. And um, moreover, in Nevada, it admit it met it impacts the administration of livestock grazing permits on public lands. 
which are tied to the conditions that are described in the U.S. Drought Monitor. So in addition to that, Nevada has a really sparse hydrological and meteorological network of data collection. So we don't have a lot of data um, for the USDM depictions, which are based on you know, very, uh, uh, not as many observations as we would like. So consequently, differences in representation, impact land use management decisions, and the focus of federal relief programs, and consequently, livelihoods in Nevada. And so all of us, including the US Drought Monitor authors, have limited data to understand and depict drought in Nevada, which leads to restrictions in range areas that might still be suitable for grazing cattle historically in our area. Um, the majority of the efforts to improve uh, our understanding of drought has been to solicit as best we can more impact reports and more um, condition monitoring observation reports. But one of the problems that we have in Nevada or challenges is that they may not be very generalizable because of the microclimates and the variability that we have. And they're also not um, immediately actionable given the way that the permitting system is devised. So we have kind of an inflexible non-response to changes in weather and, and vegetative conditions that um, make reporting um, take folks time and not necessarily see the benefits from sharing that information. Um, and the fact that there are benefits from reporting and sharing contributes to a lack of trust between agencies and permittees sometimes. So the physical geography of Nevada limits the generalizability of data, um, even though while really reliable and valid in one place, it's just not often very generalizable. And yet, because we have such variety, um, and so we want more consistent, distributed, reliable, and regularly repeated observations. But this is also a problem and not an easy task in Nevada because we have these wide open lands and we don't have local drought impact report groups. So that leads me to say that my update today is just from three counties. Um, and my update really does highlight this variability that we have across the state. So I'm going to start with um, Humboldt County, the information I have from Humboldt County as of last week, using numbers from the Western Regional Climate Center and information passed on to me from Brad Schultz, who is our extension educator there is that generally there's decent precipitation this year across many areas but there's lots of there can be local anom anomalies um, good forage production is really dependent on spring moisture to keep from depleting soy moisture early in growing areas especially at lower elevations it was dry in many areas last year but it was exceptionally wet the year before that's the 2019 water year and there's some carryover of forage and water was likely the mid and upper elevation snowpack and PowerPoint are a little light, I mean, and um, precipitation are a little light in some areas, but not exceptional. And some areas had good forage production um, due to some well-timed spring moisture and reasonable warm temperatures in these elevations. Um, probably better south slope snowpack than many years as storms have come somewhat consistently and there hasn't been long warm spells. So spring runoff this year may be average or so in some conditions, with even though there's a uh, little less than average moisture. Again, he wanted to stress that it really depends on how the spring moistures and temperatures pan out and there could be local anomalies. The real concern reported this year was the uh, predominantly cheat grass as a forage base and lot, a lot of carryover feed from last year, but production this year was really poor in most areas. But he said it's still too, ter still too, ter too early to tell but we are showing some signs of a cheap grass die-off. Um, he also gave me a little bit of a report on Lander County moving in um, towards more central Nevada as drier, and especially in the central and southern parts, dry for two years now, and though the northern area is not nearly as severe. But in Eureka County in central Nevada, um, I hear anecdotally from Gary, who's on the call, that it's the pits there, and that the BLM and the Forest Service are already warning that turnout numbers might be reduced, and people are growing supplemental feed on private lands. So we have 
near normal conditions in Humboldt and Northwestern to the pits more in central Nevada. And with that, that brings me to the end of my update for today, but I will share those links and, I'm, and Gary and I are available for questions. Great, thanks, Eugene. Sorry, Lauren, you're in charge, I forgot, go ahead. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's fine. Um, just a reminder, we'll hold our questions. Uh, next up, we've got Leslie Roche. She's a Cooperative Extension Specialist in Rangeland Science and Management at UC Davis and Director of the UC Rangelands uh, Network. Um, and she's gonna share today about drought impacts on California's rangelands. Hey, Lauren, can you see my screen all right? Yes, I can. Great, okay. <laughs> Trying to get this not proficient at GoToWebinar here. <laughs> okay, yeah, so today I'm gonna talk about ongoing and developing drought impacts to California's rangelands and how, um, really how this year's precipitation has impacted rangeland and forage conditions in the state and how it may continue to do so going through the spring and into summer. So um, first I wanna give a little bit of the um, California context. Uh, California rangelands are incredibly biologically diverse. Um, we span a diversity of environments, range types and climates. We have of course our iconic um, annual species dominated systems such as the oak woodland and uh, grassland and annual grasslands. Um, we also, which are um, you know, very vital to many of the ranching operations across the state. These annual grassland dominated systems, um, you know, support an estimated 70% uh, of the forage base for the state's herd. But we also have, um, you know, also critically important um, perennial grasslands, which is in the Intermountain region, and of course, uh, mountain meadows uh, throughout the forested region in the Sierra Nevada and Cascade ranges. So this contributes to a lot of growing season differences throughout the state, annual versus perennial. And we have some, uh, you know, uh, three sort of general uh, climate zones uh, throughout the state, including the Mediterranean, the cold desert steppe, and the warm desert. In total, rangelands in California uh, cover about 57 million acres, so a little, a little over half of the state, and about 34 million of that is, um, is grazed. So in California, this diversity um, also supports what we call transhuman ranching, and that's where livestock are moved between pasture-based uh, forage resources in a um, seasonal cycle. So typically, you know, uh, livestock are moved to the lowlands in the winter, or which are um, our annual grasslands, and then to the um, higher elevations um, in the summer, which are those mountain meadows and, and perennial grasslands. And so there's a lot of um, interdependence across these different systems um, across California. So that's just to give you a little bit of the um, California context. Um, of course, you know, in terms of um, resilience to drought, and, you know, ranches and rangelands, these communities um, that are reliant on these systems are potentially the most vulnerable um, to climate variability and change, given their dependence on such a um, such highly climate sensitive resource. These are predominantly rain and snow fed systems, um, and so coping with and adapting to drought is critical to the sustainability and resilience of these systems. And this was particularly evident um, during California's statewide historic drought several years ago. So in um, better understanding um, drought resilience and how to build capacity um, to adapt to drought, um, a little over um, about 10 years ago, um, we started working with ranchers and rangeland managers throughout California to look at adaptive management and drought mitigation. And so we started with um, some baseline surveys working with California Cattlemen's Association and um, really learned a lot about um, drought adaptation um, learning, you know, about, you know, the, the types, the numbers of practices that people use and um, their um, drought planning, planning process. And then a few years ago, when the historic drought hit, um, some collaborators and I led some rancher interviews in 2016 to really understand and evaluate um, the, how their drought preparation response strategies and how their outlooks might have been influenced by such a historic event. And um, in, in this instance, we, we ended up interviewing uh, 48 ranchers, which included 20 cattle producers, 15, 15 sheep producers, and 13 with multi-species operations. 
And so in a, in a nutshell, what we've learned, so looking at some of the proactive uh, strategies that folks developed during that historic drought, the practices that they use um, to prepare for potential drought, these really all boil down to conserving forage and uh, maintaining flexibility. So doing things like incorporating um, pasture rest and stockpiling um, um, forage, um, as well as conservative stocking, but it's pretty um, common theme throughout all of the different operations. In terms of the reactive strategies, um, which is um, something that's becoming um, increasingly important as uh, this current season um, moves along, um, these were really all about conserving forage and maintaining flexibility. So across all the operations, we saw you know high percent use of folks using you know just purchasing feed to um, to sustain the you know the, the core livestock herd. Also um, you know reducing herd size, so deep culling, for example, and um, weaning early. So getting those um, the 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 calves and the lambs off the the mothers. Um, during that high energy and nutrient demand period for them when, when forage conditions are lacking. So um, that's what we've been learning working with um, ranchers and rangeland managers to understand how they have adopted and adapted um, drought management strategies um, over you know, multiple, multiple generations and how um, you know, they coped with um, the, the historic um, drought that we had several years ago. So where we are now in terms of the 2021 growing season or, or, or water year, of course, as we just heard, um, we started off, you know, um, uh, you know, a bit dry in Southern California, a little um, harder hit in Northern California, and those conditions have continued to um, persist. Um, as both Dan and Nathan um, discussed, we while we have had some recent precipitation. It hasn't been a drought buster, and we're really lacking those big storms that are so um, so important. One of the things that, that um, stuck out to me, Dan mentioned that uh, 1976 and 1977 was the last time that precipitation was as low as it has been, has been in the last two years. And when we interviewed ranchers um, right before our historic drought several years ago, many of them um, discussed 1976 and 77 as being the drought of their generation. So that's um, something to think about as we move on into the current year. So in um, thinking about getting information to the U.S. Drought Monitor and a coordinated approach, uh, a group of us from UC Cooperative Extension have been working now for the last several years, uh, since about 2018, with um, with partners um, across um, agencies as well as other technical service providers to provide um, information on on the ground conditions. And so we developed this survey, which um, was originally adapted from the Drought Impact Reporter, which is now, um, of course, known as CMOR. And this is something that we've been doing semi regularly. Um, the current year, we've actually um, been sending this call out monthly to our uh, rangeland professionals including UC Cooperative Extension Rangeland Livestock Advisors, Natural Resource Conservation um, Service uh, Range Specialists, and uh, Resource Conservation District uh, staff as well. And we've been, we were very fortunate in California. We have a pretty broad um, network of uh, range and livestock professionals, um, particularly within uh, Cooperative Extension. So we have pretty good representation throughout, um, you know, most of the, the 58 counties in the state. So, just going to uh, quickly, we're running out of time here, go through a little bit of what we've been seeing across the state. I'll just go in regions. Don't worry, I'm not going to go county by county. Um, start off with the good news. Um, in the North Coast, while it has been normal to mildly dry, forage growth um, conditions um, have, been, have been average to above average. It is still early for, um, for this region, and the late uh, spring rains really are um, important for them. Um, but for, for the North Coast, you know, a little bit of mild drought is actually in terms of livestock production is actually a little bit more beneficial for forage production because in an average year, they're typically, um, you know, dealing with the challenge of, of flooding. In uh, northeastern, uh, northern and northeastern California, again, it's still early um, for this region. Uh, they are, um, you know, we're getting reports of moderately to severely dry conditions. So that, um, resulting in reduced forage production. We're seeing some extended hay feeding, um, both you know, before and after their typical, um, their typical periods. 
Um, also, there, uh, while there is some snow high up in the watershed, it's, um, we're hearing that's very dry um, down below. And so that's resulting in reduced surface runoff and abnormally low stream flow and, of course, reduced water availability. For the Sierra foothills, um, reports we've been receiving are uh, moderately to severely dry conditions, um, resulting in normal to reduced forage production. So a little bit of variability, but in general, um, the um, typical seasonal creeks and ponds are um, dry, even with the recent rainfall that they have received. So it really hasn't, hasn't busted those drought conditions yet. Um, there have been uh, reports of producers already using supplemental feeding and some are starting to consider and, and um, set those trigger dates for their decisions on potential early weaning and even deep culling. And this is follow up to the culling that's already occurred uh, normally during the fall period. For the Sacramento Valley, um, I, so again, um, severely dry actually, with reduced forage production and reduced surface runoff. This has um, resulted in uh, lack of a, you know, restricted availability of, of forage and pasture due to the lack of water. So even if there was um, you know, near normal forage conditions, that forage is not accessible if there's not livestock water nearby for the animals. So there's some concerns there. We're also hearing particularly in Glen, Glen and Calusa counties, so a little bit north, uh, a little bit of the northern Sacramento Valley. Um, Several irrigation districts are, are already um, sending out notifications of reduced irrigation allocations. And so that's um, already a, a little bit early to be um, uh, seeing um, those, those decisions made already. For the Bay Delta uh, region, moderately to severely dry, uh, again, reduced forage production, and again, that um, availability of pastures being restricted due to that lack, a lack of water. Uh, San Joaquin Valley, uh, so the, the southern part of the Great Valley for California, moderately to severely dry, reduced forage production. Uh, we're getting lots of reports from producers that are seeing conditions that are worse than what they experienced in 2013 and 2014. Um, some are already shipping livestock very, um, you know, pretty early. One producer sent in a report that they were they were shipping um, lamb six weeks early than their typical um, time because of a lack of um, forage in their nearby coastal, coastal range hills. In the central and south coast, moderately to severe dry, conditions are variable. Um, Ventura County seems to be um, uh, you know, hit the hardest right now. Uh, rainfall has been late and infrequent, re uh, resulting in reduced forage production. And there have been reports of some, uh, some ranches selling livestock early. So um, just to wrap up, so we've, we're, we'll continue to do these um, calls to our network of rangeland professionals to get information in, uh, to the, the drought monitor and others. Um, we'll be doing these uh, monthly and we um, are actually gonna be adding a summer report so we can keep this going annually as well. Um, we, a lot of this information we also host on a rangeland drought hub for stakeholders in California to, um, to access as well as connect with others. And then for those that are interested, we, during the several, first several months of the pandemic, we actually started a semi-regular um, uh, weekly or semi-regular webinar called Working Rangelands Wednesdays, in which um, we spotlighted um, issues surrounding California's working rangelands. And as you can imagine, a lot of those um, either directly focused on or integrated to a significant degree um, coping with and adapting to drought. So we have um, several of those posted now. <clears throat> um, Quite a few of our um, webinars um, highlighted panels of ranchers and rangeland managers and, and how they were um, planning for um, potential future drought and how they were dealing with the dry conditions that they've been experiencing for the last two years. So that's all I have for, for now. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I didn't run over too long. Thanks, Leslie. Um, <clears throat> so we've got just a couple of minutes for questions and I'd don't see any in the question or chat box. Um, maybe I'm, I think so Amanda, if you see some that I don't see, please. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what you see, but there's one question for um, Leslie. Um, how do you quantify the effect effectiveness values of a given strategy by ranchers? I think this was talking a little bit about your earlier part of your talk. Oh yeah. So um, actually I can, um, I can uh, send that publication later to share with folks. 
but those are actually, so those are self-reported effectiveness values. So we did um, through the interviews and surveys, we asked folks <clears throat> to rank on a scale of, you know, one to five. Um, so their, their personal evaluation of the effectiveness of, for their operation. So those are self-reported effectiveness values. Good. And then um, Lauren, I don't see any other ones, but there was a comment just, oh, maybe there are a few other ones popping in. Um, let's see. This one says, have you done a comparison between rangeland uses and the new quote, meats being developed by tech for water usage? That might be a better offline question, I'm not sure. Um, I, I haven't, but we, there are some emerging partnerships at UC Davis that I believe are looking at um, some of those <clears throat> um, alternatives, but I personally um, haven't done any work on that. And then last one, I just want to mention that Gary, who's for, for, who we didn't hear from, but he's part of with Carrie Jean's presentation from Nevada, just wanted to mention that California drought also affects Nevada producers because that's where many of our weaned calves are sent. Um, so that's a nice little note to to add to some of this of the linkages between the two states. Um, with that, Lauren, I'm ready to close the webinar if you are. Um, yeah. I'm ready. Okay, great. Um, so thanks everyone for listening. Thank you for going over time with us as well. We had a lot of great information we wanted to share this time and thank you so much to all our presenters for sharing. Um, so hopefully everyone who stuck it out was worth your time and thank you so much for being here. Um, I just want to remind folks that the recording of this webinar will be available on drought.gov and the NIDIS YouTube channel very soon, like probably before tomorrow, but if not, the day after. And our next webinar is scheduled for Monday, May 24th. Uh, we are currently working on making that more of a, our, usually every year we do that as our fire themed webinar to have more of the fire outlook, some fire research and information shared for that. And so we're working on that agenda now. Um, you can already find that registration open on the news and events on drought.gov or we send it out an email to you all after the webinar. I'll also just mention our next drought status update if you've seen some of these that we've been sending, sending out which are as an update um, a document or a web page of updates of the conditions and outlooks. Our next one is scheduled for early April and it will be posted on drought.gov and you can also find all the state information from California, Nevada or the California Drought Early Warning System on there as well. Um, with that, I will go ahead and close the webinar and say thank you everyone for listening and thank you again to our great presenters.